brothers, sisters, siblings, and comrades. I'm Daniel from SoCal Toronto. And I'm Dan from somewhere near Moncton. This is The Red Review, a podcast brought to you by Socialist Action Canada, Ligue pour l'Action Socialiste, a revolutionary, internationalist, Trotskyist party active in the class struggle that seeks to overthrow capitalism and all its systems of exploitation and oppression. Also, you can find us in that system of exploitation and oppression on YouTube, where we film weekly live webcasts and host educational conferences on various revolutionary topics. And we're active on social media, including Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Links are in the description. In the next 45 minutes, we will recap the major events in the class war that is raging both within our colonial borders and abroad. And we are also happy to be joined today by Yvonne Hansen, an eco-socialist from Vancouver, who ran as NDP candidate in the 2019 federal election and is a leading member of Socialist Action, who will talk about the ongoing actions to stop old growth logging in so-called British Columbia. We'll also be joined by Sandra Griffith Bonaparte, president of the Union of National Defense Employees Local 70607 and the Labour Forward candidate for vice president at the upcoming Canadian Labour Congress. All of us who worked on this podcast live and work on indigenous lands across Turtle Island. We recognize that there can be no true reconciliation without restitution, which includes land back and seizing the assets of the major resource corporations and returning them to the commons. But before we begin this Red Review, let's hear from our comrade Ellen in British Columbia, who will tell us about our sponsor this month. This month, we are proud to announce that we are not being sponsored by Nestle, the mega corporation which makes money by commodifying our most precious resource, water. But you don't become as successful as Nestle without also ruthlessly exploiting people too. The world's largest producer of bottled water used trafficked child slaves to harvest cocoa beans in Côte d'Ivoire. It also aggressively marketed baby formula as a replacement for breastfeeding to poor mothers in impoverished nations despite horrible health consequences for babies. And while we appreciate the lack of support from Nestle, we wish to extend our solidarity to the 470 Nestle workers of Unifor Local 252 who walked off the job at the Toronto Nestle Chocolate Factory early in May to fight against two-tiered wages. Here on the pod, we stand in solidarity with striking workers. Thanks, uh, thanks a lot, Ellen. Now, in oligarch news. Galen Weston died earlier in the year. It was April 12th, 2021. Mayor of Toronto, John Tory, tweeted that Galen Weston was one of our most decent community-minded leaders. His grace, generosity, compassion, and business acumen made Toronto a much better place. He will be very much missed. We instead choose to remember Galen Weston as a ruthless capitalist who fixed the price of bread for over 10 years and canceled so-called hero pay for frontline grocery workers only months into the pandemic, despite skyrocketing profits. Now, Galen Weston and his family extracted billions of dollars from working class people through the exploitation of labor, including myself. Including yourself. Yeah, you used to work for Galen Weston, did you not? Uh, indirectly. I mean, everybody, if you're working at one of the superstores, did you, where'd you work? It was an independent grocer, so he got oh. a lot of uh, it. Got a lot of uh, a lot all of the, the profits, but not all stuff, of it. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, that makes sense. It's amazing, though. So now we're down to just the one Galen Weston. Yeah, uh, the the Canadian stockpile is definitely uh, running low. Our strategic reserve is absolutely. Yeah, and if we see what John Tory is tweeting, like this is a big crisis, you know. Very soon we might see the last, you know, this is like a tortoise on the Galapagos Island, you know, one last Galen Weston. So moving from oligarch news to other labor news, in the last weeks of April, over a thousand Montreal port workers who are organized with the Canadian Union of Public Employees gave notice that they would go on strike to fight the imposition of longer work shifts. The labor stoppage was an escalation where previously they were refusing to work overtime or on weekends, and they actually had a brief strike that ended it in the summer of 2020. Mm -hmm. Now, these workers, again, a thousand of them at one of the busiest ports in Canada, 
have not had a contract since the end of 2018. What? And the announcement of this upcoming strike really got the capitalists in a tizzy with the Montreal Board of Trade CEO saying, quote, the union is taking the economy hostage. Wait, Dan, what do you think about wait, that? Wait, 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 wait. Okay. <laughs> Hold the phone. Yeah. Um, <laughs> okay. I, I'm like no expert, obviously. Of course not. I'm, I'm like... I don't know. I, I took an economics course once. Nice. Once. Yeah. Oh. And, and I'm I'm like 84% confident that that's what a strike is. Yep. I I think. I, I think that is the entire point. The only power workers really have is in refusing labor, which makes what the government did so egregious. The federal liberal government worked overtime after the port workers announced they would go on strike. And they did walk off for a few days, but the strike was hardly even a few days old when they legislated port workers back to work by May 1st. So so wait, th- this isn't the first time that nope. uh, Trudeau's done this, uh, like going against the Constitution. That happened before back in uh, 2018, right? Yeah, yeah. Trudeau's government also passed back to work legislation, which is what it's called in 2018, to break up the rotating postal workers strike. So same thing, in both cases, what the government did was deemed the work quote unquote essential and basically said by, you know, staying home and exercising your right to strike collectively, you're, you know, again, you're holding the economy, you're hurting the economy too much. You're, You're stopping essential services, which I think is quite, it's, it's infuriating, is it not? No, that's insane, what? It's, it's ridiculous. And in my mind, okay, you have essential workers. And there are some professions where I think people would say, yeah, you're a nurse. You, you can't just all literally walk off the job. But at that point, pay them. Give them what they want. If they're so essential that they're not allowed to strike, in my mind, that means they have infinite leverage. They're so important that literally give them everything they want. They're so valuable. And we should be happy to give it to them. Because they're not asking for a lot. They're just asking for a say in how their work is conducted. It seems very reasonable to me. I mean, but you have to consider, of course, there's there's a lot of uh, workers out there who can take those jobs. But when you go to a job like being Galen Weston, there's now only one of those. Exactly. Which, it's supply-demand. Again, yep. I took one economics course and so that it just makes a lot of sense. No, exactly. The Galen Westons of the world are irreplaceable and deserve their billions, while the port workers get the Trudeau government working real fast to make sure that they don't exercise any collective power for a few reasons, I'm sure. One, to make sure that, you know, in that situation, the government saves money, but also to prevent other workers from realizing like, hey, strikes work, mm. strikes get the goods. It's really important for them to make sure that these things don't escalate, right? Yeah, and uh, speaking of government saving money, uh, one of the first acts of uh, Doug Ford's conservative government in Ontario, if you recall, was scrapping the the measly two paid sick days that were introduced by the previous liberal government. When the pandemic raged in the province, uh, health professionals, activists, labor, and revolutionaries all demanded permanent employee paid sick days to not only fight the pandemic, but as part of a broader justice for workers movement. So they deflected more times than I care to recount and voted down a paid sick day program 23 times in provincial parliament, despite the vast majority of Ontarians supporting these programs. And the last time the conservative majority voted against paid sick days came only one day after 13-year-old Emily Victoria Viega died of COVID-19 in Brampton, Ontario, a girl whose father worked in a factory that did not provide sick days, uh, where those who were sick couldn't afford to stay home. And uh, when he contracted COVID-19, it spread through the family. It killed his daughter and uh, put his wife in the hospital. Instead, Ford touted the conservatives' paid sick day plan, which he described as the most comprehensive plan in the entire country and the best in North America. So what was the plan? Only three paid sick days. That's it. That was the best plan in North America. And let me ask, Dan, were these employee paid sick days? Hang on. So I want to say yes. Obviously, I, w- I want to say yes. But they're um, not. They weren't. They're taxpayer paid. 
So we're subsidizing the corporations to do what is right, as we often have to do. Let me ask you again, are these permanent? Are these permanent sick days? They should be. You still be. want to say yes? No, yeah, I mean, I know be. they should be. <laughs> uh, they're not. Uh, the program expires in the fall. And what do you think about this question? Are three paid sick days enough? Uh... <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, we all know that they're not. And there's a few reasons we know why three paid sick days are not good enough. You have the Ontario Science Table, which was advocating for paid sick days uh, as an effective measure to fight the pandemic. And after Ford announced this program, they were forced to clarify that, quote, we've modeled the strong, effective sick pay as beginning immediately, lasting for essentially two weeks, and being at a level that allows people to not have to make difficult choices, end quote. What they implied was that the Ford program did none of that. It was too short. It wasn't just part of your paycheck. You had to apply for it. And it, it really did not provide enough money for most people such that, you know, it was a no-brainer for them to stay home if they were sick. But yeah. here's the second reason why we know that it wasn't enough. Well, you, you say that, you know, it's not enough, right? Yes. But, but really, if you take into account... Um, you know, the, j just as long as it's consistent, you can you can at least respect them for it, right? Like as long as you, if they're sticking to their guns, uh, it's atrocious, it's horrible, but like at least they have integrity. What was really ironic, though, was right around the time that the provincial conservatives in Ontario were making a mockery of what paid sick days ought to be. Uh, Doug Ford had to isolate because he came into contact with someone who was COVID positive. And he continued to be paid his full salary of over $800 a day while isolating for this. And so that went to show like... What? Yeah, I, I know. What? It's, it's, oh it's my amazing. word. He, you mean, oh, oh no. And just after I stuck up for him too. I know. Oh, so much for integrity. And... It's paid sick days for me, not for thee. And the unfortunate thing, though, is we, we expect this from conservatives. They are the most unabashedly neoliberal, austere government. They are so pro-corporation. They just kind of have to obviously uh, do a lot of dog whistling to get their, their base rallied up around what really is not good for any worker. But what's amazing is that the only mass labor party in Canada, the NDP... Well, we expected more from them, didn't we? I know I did. Uh, and then they enacted an equally pitiful pay, uh, paid sick days program with only uh, three paid sick days. Uh, and yep. The program is, is going to expire in December, which is, is a, it's a program. It is a program, technically. On paper, it is a program. Yeah. Uh, now, Labor Minister Harry Baines here said that the government will support employers with the cost of paying the sick days. So just for those of you who were worried that we would be, you know, causing the corporations to lose uh, some of their profits uh, in the name of the, the worker's safety, uh, don't fear. The president of the BC Federation of Labor, Laird Cronk, pointed out that the amount offered is less than the minimum wage in BC for somebody working full-time hours, and there's too long a lag between when a worker stays home from work and when they can expect to be paid through the program. Yep, so it's basically all the same criticisms that you can you know, throw at the Ontario Conservatives. You can basically say the same thing about Horgan's provincial NDP government in British Columbia, which really, really ought not to be the case when you are the party of labor. And it's hard to think of something that's more pro-labor than making the corporations actually take care of their employees. At least if you're going to exploit them, at least make it so that they can survive. But that's mm. obviously too much here. Yeah, and I think the most disheartening thing here has got to be the uh the the cost of living in in especially these provinces that we're talking about here mm -hmm. um that that there it's just on the rise it's like it's, yep. it's only going up yep 
We have stagnating wages. We have increasing rent, though. So people are just being kind of squeezed between a rock and a hard place that are just melting into one hard rock place with workers in the middle. And that's not a good situation for workers because that kills them. I think that's called exploitation. I uh, think so. And I, I think that's called a great analogy, by the way. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Continuing, indeed it is. Yeah, Indeed it is. Continuing in British Columbia, because here on the pod, we're going to love dunking on John Horgan, because again, we expect better. So what else are people upset about in British Columbia? Well, Extinction Rebellion Vancouver is super upset about the continuation of old growth logging in Vancouver at Ferry Creek. Uh, Extinction Rebellion Vancouver, as part of their Spring Rebellion, uh, executed a series of direct actions, including a blockage of the Granville Street Bridge. They blocked major intersections. And for those of you who don't know, Extinction Rebellion is an environmental group. They function through direct action, and they're active in many cities around the world. And they demand that the government and the media tell the truth about the ongoing and impending climate catastrophe, and that governments act accordingly and immediately but that's not what's happening with our John Horgan government in BC. Yeah, on uh, on May 17th, uh, RCMP uh, started uh, enforcing an injunction against protesters and established exclusion zones. And not only are the RCMP weaponizing the injunction against protesters, but journalists too. So they're prompting a coalition of Canadian news organizations filing a legal challenge uh, just a couple of days ago on, on the 26th. And on that same day, over a hundred seniors swarmed to the RCMP exclusion zone. Later, I think that's inspiring. Yeah, yeah, that's, uh, that's wonderful. Uh, now later we'll talk to Yvonne Hansen, uh, an activist, an XR member, and revolutionary socialist who was the NDP nominee in the 2019 federal election who participated in these direct actions. Yeah, I hear she has some good stories for us. It's it's really gross. I don't know if you've seen the viral photos of the huge like trees being just transported down the highway. These are trees that are hundreds, if not over a thousand years old. And in my personal opinion, they ought to be treated like monuments. We ought to be respecting them. We can't simply replace them. And it's amazing that a private corporation has the RCMP acting on their behalf to prevent people from defending these trees and to even prevent journalists from reporting on it. Mm. it. It really shows you who the police and who the RCMP are fighting for, and they're not fighting for us. Yeah, yeah. Uh, no, this, uh, this, I mean, it's just tragic. It, it's, uh, it's pretty bad. In news across the border, uh, Michigan Governor Gretchen Whitmer canceled a decades-old legal authorization and gave Enbridge, Enbridge, uh, <laughs> a re- probably going to be a recurring friend of this podcast, <laughs> uh, uh, until May 12th, 2021 to cease operations. Now, Line 5 carries up to 540,000 barrels per day of crude oil products uh, from Superior, Wisconsin to Sarnia, Ontario. And this line lays exposed at the bottom of the environmentally sensitive Straits of Mackinac, uh, which link Lake Michigan to Lake Huron. Now, despite extensive environmental concerns, Enbridge is defiant and continues pumping fossil fuels. Indeed, the National Wildlife Federation reported in 2017 that Line 5 has leaked over 1 million gallons of oil. Uh, since the 60s. Yeah, and that's a lot to put it into context. It's it's like a lot of oil. And the Great Lakes, I take it for granted. I grew up in Windsor, kind of right nestled in there around Lake Erie. Mm. These are, again, irreplaceable ecosystems. We're talking about some of the largest reserves of fresh water on the planet. And we have people just pumping oil through it, just... If you see the photos, the line just runs on the bottom of the like the riverbed. They're kind of like crusted with like barnacles and stuff. It's no wonder it's it's leaking all the time. Now, Gretchen Whitmer, great for you. You are, you know, seeing that this is an environmental catastrophe waiting to happen. 
not everybody sees it that way. Trudeau and the liberals, unsurprisingly, are pushing back. More disappointing is that Yagmeet Singh is also against the closure of Line 5, despite claiming that the NDP is a pro-environment party. Yeah, it's really frustrating to see the NDP have to compete with the liberals on the worst take here, because the Green Party, despite being a green capitalist party, is actually taking the very obvious position of not fighting against the closure. So instead, here at Red Review, we stand with both the indigenous groups and the environmental groups that are fighting on the ground against the continued use of this pipeline. And more broadly, I don't think it's a horribly controversial statement, but maybe it is for some. No more pipelines. What do you think about that, Dan? I think that if somebody listening is going to stop listening because we took that stance, they probably stopped listening a while ago. <laughs> That's probably <laughs> fair. Maybe when we started ragging on Galen Weston a bit, they're like, ah, this was not what I thought this was going to be at all. Yeah, gosh, I thought that this was a liberal podcast. That's what the color is, right? That's true. Like oh, man. They're going to be very confused about the historic association of red with communism. Fuck. And then other people are going to see this and just assume that liberals are communists. And they're yeah. also not going to be listening to this portion. <laughs> no, there's actually a very large percentage of people who are not going to listen to this for a lot of reasons. But mm. if you are listening, we appreciate you. Indeed. So we have a few items left here to recover. Yeah. On May 13th, a for-profit corporation known as Greyhound announced that they would no longer provide domestic service in Canada. Now, the business model of providing bus service between small population centers apparently isn't lucrative enough, and so now thousands of Canadians have been left in the lurch. Uh, we have a comrade, Emily, who actually posted about this and, and said, quote, this cuts off mobility for thousands of people. I've relied heavily on Greyhound over the past many years, and I know many others who are still reliant on this service. Go, which is a service in Ontario, is both more expensive and often way less efficient. And I, I agree with Emily here. This is why we can't rely on the private industries to meet our public needs. Because if the public need becomes unprofitable, the private corporations will simply just abandon the service, regardless of whether people still need it or not, and whether or not there is an alternative. The federal NDP has laid the blame on the federal government for not avoiding this, which is a reasonable take to, to make here. It, we just need to nationalize it. All transportation is essential and it ought to be run for public need, not for private greed. Again, another hot take here. That's, it's, it's the hottest take. And lastly, I check in with 1492 Landback Lane, where Haudenosaunee land defenders took back indigenous land uh, just last year from Foxgate Developments, who earmarked this land for development, for housing development. July 19th uh, of this year will be one year of land back, of continuous land back. Hmm. And the land defenders and their supporters, though, unsurprisingly, have been targeted by the police a lot. Really? I know, right? Go figure. A report earlier in February revealed that the Ontario Provincial Police, the OPP, spent $16 million on surveilling and terrorizing land defenders and the allies that would be bringing supplies. It's a tense standoff, and with courts granting a permanent injunction against 1492 land back land, land defenders are de facto criminalized. They are criminals in the eye of our court systems and in the eye of our government. Leaving the camp means risking arrest, and as a result, a leader of this land back movement Skylar Williams surrendered himself to police on May 19th and faces six charges. And he says, every waking hour of my life for the last 10 months has been 1492 Landback Lane. I need to be able to spend some time with my kids without having to look over my shoulder. Oh. And it, it's, it's an awful situation that they're facing. Uh, I can't imagine being there. And that's obviously the government strategy here. They're trying to wake them out. And they're trying to smoke mm -hmm. them out. Mm -hmm. I yeah. think a lot of people support them. And there's some necessary support from labor as well here. And that's that's like necessary in, mm -hmm. in 
in these sorts of cases. Um, the Ontario Federation of Labor here actually showed up to support Skylar Williams and recently dropped off fruit trees to help with the rejuvenation of traditional food supply there. Um, so we'll be likely coming back to this in future episodes uh, and uh, following up on this. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. And for everybody else out there, 1492 Landback Lane, if you have any ability to support them, uh, mm-hmm. financially or with resources they're active on twitter and they constantly post things that you can buy to help them out it, it really is the first step of the revolution the revolution can't happen when indigenous people are actively being colonized and that that is one of the de facto battlegrounds in in our class war and lastly on may 27 Of just this month, the remains of 215 children, some as young as three years old, were found buried on the grounds of what was once Kamloops Indian Residential School, which was the largest residential school in Canada. Chief Roseanne Casimir, who spearheaded this effort of the Tecumloops to Sewehm First Nations, described this as an unthinkable loss that previously was only spoken about but never documented. And that's really what this effort was. Now, for people saying that this is a, quote, a painful reminder of that dark and shameful chapter of our country's history, they are either ignorant or intentionally concealing that this is the entire story arc of the Canadian state, as so many people have been pointing out online. This is the plot of Canada. Now, real quick, Dan, Who do you think said that quote? And do you think they're either A, ignorant, or B, uh, intentionally concealing genocide? Now, I'm really bad at guessing. (laughs) Shaun the Dark, Dan, come on. The fact that you're asking this means that it it has to be somebody, it's got to be Justin Trudeau. It is. Yeah, no, you you nailed it. So Justin Trudeau is our colonizer-in-chief, and that was his tweet about this news report breaking a painful reminder of that dark and shameful chapter. I love that that, you know, I have a communications background, linguistics, you know, Mm. of that, you know, intentionally kind of just pushing it into our rear view mirror. And it's, it's disgusting. And because it isn't a dark and shameful chapter, it is the plot of what Canada is. And there's evidence everywhere. So yeah. yeah, tell us what what else is happening now in BC. There's also uh Brian Ouellette, who is uh Métis and once served as counsel for the National Inquiry into Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women and Girls uh and broke that social workers in BC were forcing indigenous girls in foster care to get IUDs. Now, what we do know is that indigenous children are 10 times more likely in BC to be taken from their families and placed into foster care as well. And yeah. it's 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 an ongoing thing. There are actually more indigenous children in child protective services now than there ever were in indigenous schools. Uh, and it, so it's an ongoing thing and it's the same thing with incarceration. Another stat I saw was nationally uh, despite only being roughly like 5% of the population, indigenous women are something like 40% of the prison population. So mm-hmm. it's 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 systemic. You can't say in any other way. And just looping back to Brinolette and this, this kind of report, it's not fully fleshed out yet. Uh, according to, to Bryn, they are still in the process of this. Uh, the survivors aren't necessarily at the moment ready to speak up. But the idea is, you know, in these foster care situations where everything is so brutal, uh, the IUD is meant to be a prophylactic in case, you know, they get sexually assaulted by the people that are meant to be, you know, quote unquote, taking care of them. This is just the latest reminder that the Canadian colonial state is founded in the genocide of hundreds of indigenous communities. It is not a genocide of years past. It is an ongoing genocide today. And it is not a genocide of indigenous people. It's, an, a, it's a genocide of hundreds of indigenous communities that existed across Turtle Island and still exist today. Now, before we go on to covering Canadian imperialism abroad, we're going to quickly listen in to a Canadian Heritage Moment recorded by Ellen. This is our first Canadian Heritage Moment. 100 years ago, Canadian scientist James Collip Frederick Banting, Charles Best, and John McLeod discovered insulin. 
They famously sold the patent for one dollar each to the University of Toronto, which mass-produced and distributed insulin and other life-saving drugs and vaccines to Canadians at cost via the Connaught Labs Crown Corporation. That is, until 1986, when the Connaught Labs were privatized by Brian Mulroney's progressive conservative government and eventually sold to Sanofi, a for-profit pharmaceutical company who is currently being sued by diabetics for fixing the price of insulin. The selfless labor of working-class scientists whose hard efforts and ingenuity saved the lives of millions of diabetics around the world and Brian Mulroney's feckless neoliberal agenda that threw those same diabetics to the wolves are now quintessential Canadian moments. Thank you, Ellen. And we're back. And now it's time for a quick recap of some major international happenings, things outside of Canada and Canada's role in those things. Israel escalated its program of ethnic cleansing and imperialism in recent months. Palestinian resistance grew as Israel forcibly has evicted families from Sheikh Jarrah, a neighborhood in East Jerusalem. Over 10,000 worshippers at the Al-Aqsa Mosque compound were attacked with tear gas and rubber bullets by Israeli forces. Following retaliation by Hamas, which launched improvised rockets, Israel escalated aerial bombing of Gaza, which has killed hundreds of people, leveled a building housing international media, and damaged the road leading to the main hospital. Yeah, it, it destroyed a lot of key infrastructure, and that's really been the game plan in Gaza since the occupation began. Uh, destroy the farmlands, cut off access to the sea for fishing, uh, drain the water from out underneath them. And despite the one-sided nature and the brutal ethnic cleansing and occupation and, and genocide that really is at the heart of this, you know, quote unquote conflict, you have demagogues like Joe Biden, who unambiguously defends Israel's right to defend itself. And Trudeau's not much better. He has called on, quote, all parties to end the violence, which sounds like some centrist nonsense. And he supports a two-state solution, which really is a support for the status quo. Now, Trudeau has a history of rejecting the BDS movement and any economic pressure being placed on Israel. Now, conversely, the grassroots and the socialist militants of the NDP, represented by the NDP Socialist Caucus, Courage, and others, pushed NDP leader Yagmeet Singh to the left on this issue finally this year, at the NDP convention in April when they passed a resolution that called for an end to the illegal Israeli occupation and to, you know, put some some bite behind that. They called for an end to trade with the illegal settlements and an end to the arms trade between Israel and Canada. Yeah, uh, he has been calling out Justin Trudeau for asking both sides to de-escalate uh, because of this push by the party. Uh, and Trudeau, you know, he's actively sending millions of dollars worth of weapons to Israel. So this narrative about Israel and Palestine is finally beginning to shift in Canada. Uh, I have seen this, uh, not that anecdotes or data, but I have seen this uh, all over uh, the uh, Moncton region at the very least. Uh, Thousands of supporters also have taken to the streets in Winnipeg, uh, Vancouver, Edmonton, Halifax, Ottawa, and Montreal on uh, May 15th, which was the 73rd anniversary of the Nakba. Yeah, and 100,000 marched in London, UK. We have dog workers in South Africa who are refusing to load weapons destined for Israel. I myself was in Toronto at City Hall on May 15th, like we mentioned, the 73rd anniversary of the Nakba, or Mm. catastrophe, when 10,000 pro-Palestine activists greatly outnumbered just a few dozen Zionist supporters who were actually forced to take a walk of shame while being protected by the police, which according to all the comrades I know, never happened before. One of the coolest things that I have seen happening is uh, people otherwise uh, relatively moderate or unengaged with politics um, have started being exposed to 
um, not just the the current events, but also some of the details about the situation mm-hmm. uh, in the region that, that just don't get talked about, like that Gaza is more than 50% children. And that in itself has rippled through social circles that, that I've uh, been around uh, in the last little bit. It Even among people who are otherwise very much, oh, both sides. Yeah, yeah. No, absolutely. And as a result, the Canadian media is working overtime to suppress this narrative. <laughs> Aren't they ever? Yeah. So when Human Rights Watch published a report on April 27 that unequivocally declared that Israel is an apartheid state and has been for its like entire existence, uh... the CBC did not actually cover this story at all when it broke and made only a few brief references in the days that followed. What's amazing, though, is that equal or more coverage is given by the CBC to the much smaller anti-lockdown marches. So you see like the CBC and and mainstream media really pushing this, you know, and covering the fascists while the CBC is actively barring journalists from reporting on Palestine who have demanded fairer coverage on the reporting. The CBC said this was to ensure editorial distance, quote unquote. Uh, Major publications like the Toronto Star are publishing advertisements that are masquerading as editorials that are just chock Mm -hmm. full of Zionist propaganda. And following those major rallies that we talked about, you know, coast to coast to coast, the media really chose to focus on just a few skirmishes around the edges rather than show the massive solidarity surrounding Palestine and Palestinians in Canada. In Toronto, a misleading video that appeared to show a group of unprovoked young men beating an elderly Jewish man was seized upon by politicians like Toronto Mayor John Tory and Ontario Premier Doug Ford, who denounced anti-Semitism. Uh, then a longer video you know, has come out uh, just a few days later that shows that the skirmish was instigated by a Jewish Defense League uh, thug and that our innocent victim uh, was brandishing both a bat and a knife. I-, I really want to point out that this does not have any relation really to the like political conflict in a foreign country of course no so the media really is working to to paint a confusing picture because if it's confusing to people you're less likely to act you know so rather than trying to come out explicitly pro-israel it's a more covert operation in the canadian media Uh, the media and the politicians, they really are committing to a both sides narratives. You know, people on both sides need to put down their weapons while ignoring that on one side, the weapons may be rocks. And on the other side, it's a world class uh, military machine that's supported by Canada and the United States and the European Union. But the, the show of support in Canada has been brilliant and the organizing efforts of the Palestine Youth Movement and Palestine House in Toronto are to be mm-hmm. commended. And uh, again, a call for support. When, when they're out in the streets, and recently actually in, in Mississauga, they just blockaded a, a rail line uh, demanding an end to the arms trade with Israel, which really is just like the first thing that needs to be done. And that's what Yagmeet Singh is pushing now, that Canada needs to end an arms trade with Israel. So the politicians are being pushed to at least take this first step. And that's because of the incredible work of, of young Palestinians in Canada, really predominantly a lot of young Palestinian women who are leading this charge and fighting for a free Palestine and a secular Palestine, really. At the rallies and marches I've been at, they're making it very clear that there's no room for transphobia, there's no room for for uh, homophobia in the movement, no room for sexism. They're fighting for a free Palestine and that Palestine will never be free unless trans Palestinians are also free and, and women Palestinians are also free. And so I really both commend them, offer the solidarity, and I'll continue to be there on the ground helping them. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. What else do we have? There's also been, over the last few months, uh, the catastrophic second wave of COVID-19 in India, which has peaked at 415,000 new cases, new daily cases on May 7th. Uh, Over 100,000 people died in April and May, as hospitals uh, were overrun, oxygen supplies ran out. The incredible surge came with the emergence of new variants of the virus and Modi's BJP government failing to impose measures to slow the spread. So the vaccine rollout has prevented 
uh, a greater catastrophe, you know, in the U.S., in Canada, the EU, which was not available to India with only 3% of the population vaccinated as of May 25th. So the question really for that is why? Why is it that in Canada we have, you know, approaching 60% vaccinated, similar in the U.S., in the U.K.? Why is it that a country like India, which is really in, in a greater need of these vaccines now, given their current situation. And that's because the international distribution of vaccines and other key medical supplies, it's not controlled by healthcare practitioners. It's not controlled by the public. It's controlled by the capitalists. And it's operated to maximize profit rather than societal health. And India and South Africa were actually directly challenging this earlier in the year. They led a coalition of roughly 100 low and middle income countries to challenge the World Trade Organization's policy of protecting intellectual property rights. So if there was a waiver for COVID-19 related uh, patents, this would allow countries to produce their own vaccines because the formulas would be freely shared. Now, the World Trade Organization to enact this waiver, it needs to be unanimous. And even though Biden, which was really surprising, actually indicated that he's open to having this conversation, Canada and Trudeau are actually non-committal. And it, again, it only takes one country to play spoiler to something yeah. that is an obvious health action to be made. Yeah. In a Toronto Star opinion piece published on May 15th, Sri Parikar rightfully calls this a uh, crime against humanity. Uh, meanwhile, Canada dipped into COVAX, the global vaccine sharing initiative that was supposed to support poor nations in accessing vaccines. As reported by the CBC, Canada will take its share of vaccine doses from the internationally funded COVAX initiative and will not give any doses to other countries until all Canadians are vaccinated, said Procurement Minister Anita Anand. So what's remarkable is, first of all, that statement, again, like your voice indicates, sounds like a movie villain. And it's not like a bunch of other capitalist countries are even doing this. Canada is unique in this. We're the only G7 country to dip into the COVAX fund. We're the only ones doing it. It's remarkable. Why? Because we actually can't make the vaccines ourselves because we privatized our previous Crown Corporation pharmaceutical company. Yeah, uh, I mean, so Canada is among one of just 10 countries that account for 75% of vaccines that have already been administered. It's it's just inequality, and it's prolonging the pandemic that's already infected more people in 2021 than in all of 2020. Mm -hmm. And it's a system that results in Israel fully vaccinating more than 60% of its population, with only 5% of Palestinians being vaccinated uh, in occupied territories. Now, profits from publicly funded COVID-19 vaccines resulted in nine newly minted COVID billionaires, and essential workers are forced to bear the brunt of the ongoing nightmare. Which really brings us uh, full circle back to Galen Weston, right? So we have the hero pay being canceled, mm -hmm. and then we have Canada as a whole basically hoarding vaccines. Right now in Canada, we're vaccinating people that ought not to be at the front line of the global vaccination program. Mm-hmm. I mean, we have healthcare workers here that deserve it and a lot of essential workers. Now we have people that are being vaccinated. Everybody's being vaccinated here. Meanwhile, only a fraction, a small, small fraction of people living in Africa, in India, have access to what is an essential medication. Yeah, and this also is, you know, shooting ourselves in the foot. That's the other part mm -hmm. of it, right? Like as more people are infected, the rate of mutation is going to increase and... Uh, the chances that this just keeps going um, in increase, which would be really, really absolutely. good for these COVID billionaires. Oh, absolutely. Actually, there's a great quote from the Pfizer CEO when he was addressing the shareholders back in early 2021, where, you know, he was a bit upset that they were charging so little for the vaccine. You know, it, you know, it got subsidized by the governments. And as a result, they were only able to charge $20 for a vaccine. But he assured them that once this virus becomes endemic, meaning it's just circulating <sighs> forever, that they will be able to, again, charge their normal going rate of roughly $200 a vaccine. Uh... So he really assured the shareholders, you know, don't worry, we, we got this. We, we will get there. We will get even more profit coming out of this crisis. I think maybe it's time that we transition to our first guest. Absolutely. 
Our first guest is going to be Yvonne Hansen, as I mentioned. She is a leading member of Socialist Action, an eco-socialist from Vancouver, and someone who has been involved in the ongoing actions to protest the logging of old growth forests in in British Columbia. So we look forward to that conversation. All right, Yvonne, welcome to the podcast. Thanks very much. Uh, I'm excited to be here. Yeah, tell us about what's happening in Vancouver, British Columbia, with all this old growth logging. We've all seen the viral photos, obviously, these massive trees being cut down. Tell us what's happening. Yeah, and so, I mean, obviously those photos kind of really harken back to when the city was first cleared. Um, We had a lot of old growth forest here originally, as you can imagine. It was all old growth forest at one point. And so there's these photos from, you know, the early 1900s of these massive trees, like, you know, a section of a tree per truck going by. And now we're seeing it again because the last 2% of the old growth forest in BC is now at risk of being logged. Um, So I've got a few little statistics on that. So first off, there's 57 million hectares of forest in BC, but only 10 million of those hectares are protected old growth forest. Mm. And 3.7 million are at risk of being logged of those 10 million. So over 30%. And each year, 200,000 hectares are logged and 27% of what is logged each year are old growth. So basically, if you think about it, the industry, 27% of the industry is not sustainable. Mm-hmm. And you, I was reading all of these articles and things saying, oh, well, you know, we're only logging 20% old growth, 27% old growth. So that means that the industry is sustainable in the current practice. And it's like, that is just such backwards logic to me because old growth forests are not a renewable resource. It's going to take Mm -hmm. 800, 900 years for them to regrow. A lot of these trees are 800 or so years old. And Mm -hmm. these areas that are able to support these old growth trees are few and far between. You know, it's not every part of BC that can grow a tree that reaches 800 years old. There's there's certain biomes and certain, um, I guess, conditions in the ecosystem that enable trees to grow that big. And once you cut them down, you're then changing those conditions and it's possible that those trees will never be able to regrow so it's not sustainable 30 percent of the logging industry is not sustainable and what activists are saying is hey stop now and you know figure out a way to make that remaining 66 whatever percent or um 70 percent sustainable rather than stopping once we run out of these these old trees Now, there are protected areas, and the BC NDP government has recently um, announced that they are looking into protecting more areas and and figuring out a reforestry plan. You know, they said in 2017 that they were going to do that, um, and they didn't do a very good job of it, evidently. And they're saying now, I mean, today at at 2 p.m. PST, they're going to be having an announcement on, you know, rejigging the forestry sector. But... I honestly don't feel like anything that they do is going to be enough. Um, it, anybody who is willing to knock down an 800-year-old tree for, you know, a couple hundred thousand dollars, I just don't think that they have the right, like, mindset or just configuration of thoughts to be able to conceptualize that, hey, there is no amount of destruction that's tolerable. Like, you know, it's not like, we're oh, instead of knocking down 10 trees a year, we're going to knock down three trees a year. Like, mm-hmm. that's still unacceptable. And, and the way that I heard it put really well was, um, you know, if you were to knock down an 800-year-old building <laughs> that had huge cultural significance and, and sell the bricks for, like, $100,000, that would be so ridiculous. And, and I feel like you'd get, like, global outcries, like, oh, they're knocking down these crazy old buildings just for the bricks? Like, yeah, absolutely. what do you mean? Right? And, uh, and they're doing that with these trees. And it's not just that these are trees – they also have huge cultural significance to the indigenous communities here. Um, and they also have huge ecosystem significance. So they are, <laughs> they are some of the best buffers against forest fires. They're some of the best carbon sinks. They're the most biodiverse ecosystems, old growth forests in, in British Columbia. So you're hurting BC's climate resilience or climate change resilience as well as hurting, um, BC's biodiversity, which is just a double whammy. And yeah. so the government, and I just got one more point on this, the government is investing millions of dollars in, you know, making green spaces, public green spaces, which is awesome. And I, we love that, right? Yeah. But then at the same time, they're destroying the natural green spaces that already exist to make a couple million dollars. And 
<laughs> that's like such backward logic. It's like cutting up a knit blanket and then trying to sew it back together. Like it's going to unravel no matter what, <laughs> right? Um, yeah. <laughs> so I could keep going, but. Well, so tell us what are the activists on the ground then doing to fight this? So you laid out the case really clearly and plainly as to why this can't go on. So what are people doing to resist? Yeah, so right now there is a blockade. So one of the areas that is um, at risk of being logged, that is actively being logged, is Ferry Creek. And that's being logged by the Teal Jones group. Um, they're mm. a sawmill based out of Surrey. And I've got their contact information for you later if you'd like it. But <laughs> We will absolutely um, <laughs> share that. Oh, yeah, I've got their contact information. I've got all the activists and GoFundMes and things uh, to Brilliant. share that as well. But So there's activists essentially blocking the way of logging trucks with their bodies at, I think it's called 2000 Road or 200 Road. And um, currently, uh, the last information that I got was that 137 people had been arrested. And wow. some days they get as many as 2000 people out blocking that road. Um, and apparently when there are more people there, the RCMP are less violent, less aggressive, and less likely to be arresting a whole bunch of people. So the whole goal is to just keep large crowds in the way, um, which is, you know, a very common and, and successful tactic used by activists around the world. So those of our listeners who are on Vancouver Island, if you're able to make it out and, you know, stay overnight or just spend some time there, bring some food out to the people who are camping there, um, that could be enormously helpful. Just just having your eyes on the ground and, and observing what's going on. The RCMP are a lot more squeamish when it comes to beating up Indigenous elders if there's a bunch of people watching. No, absolutely. We talked a bit about this, Dan, but they're also blocking journalists from reporting on this, right? I imagine that's one reason the RCMP are a bit skittish when the cameras are rolling. So is there any developments there that we can help with? Yeah, I actually don't have too much information about that, but I did hear about that. Um, and I mean, that's like what, what big agriculture does, right? Where, mm -hmm. you know, journalists will try and come in and report on how badly animals are treated and how toxic, like literally poisonous the waste runoff and everything is, and they get completely blocked. And so we know that horrible things are going on in big agriculture. And we know that <laughs> if they're blocking journalists from documenting this, we know that horrible things are probably also going on in these ecosystems that are being logged. No. So actually in Ontario, yeah, Doug Ford, uh, last year or maybe two years ago, they did pass a bill to make it illegal to go undercover in uh, factory farms and basically report on this. So we see the same playbook everywhere. Why Horgan, yeah. though, then? We expected more from Horgan. Dan and I have talked about this a lot already on the podcast. We expect this from Ford. We expect this from Kenny. How disappointing, yeah. then, is it that it's an NDP government oh. doing this? Can I swear on this podcast? <laughs> yeah, I think you get a pass here. <laughs> okay, like, holy shit. I... I am so mad because, because yeah, you would expect this out of a conservative, you would expect this out of a liberal, but you get an NDP government and you want them to do better, right? Like you want them to care about indigenous reconciliation, first and foremost, you want them to care about the environment, all of these things that they pretend to care about, not to mention the workers. So, you know, how many, I've got some statistics here, um, 13,500 jobs approximately depend on old growth logging. So you think that a government that's able to see that old growth logging is not sustainable because there's a finite number of old growth trees would care about that many jobs. But apparently they don't. They're just going to let those keep going until we run out of trees. Like you would think that they would care about transitioning those jobs over into something more sustainable. Um, but that's never talked about. And so we have this government that's pretending to be environmentalist and, you know, pro reconciliation and pro worker. And then they're doing all of these things that actively work against all of those causes. And it, it's so disappointing. <laughs> and I, you know, I'm not, I said it once, I'm going to say it again. I will never vote for the BC NDP until they, they get their stuff together because, um, it, it's like the liberals, it, it's like, having a liberal government, like a federal liberal government, um, the BC liberals are extremely conservative, so they don't really count, but mm -hmm. it's literally like, like a federal liberal government. It's not at all like what the federal NDP would be. Well, wow. we've been complaining about Justin Trudeau as well. So that, <laughs> that's not a good comparison. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so, so you, you're tied in with, uh, Extinction Rebellion here, and this is part of, uh, such a, such a huge movement. Um, so, so, uh, can you maybe tell people about uh, Extinction Rebellion, about initiatives that are going on uh, in BC uh, and and uh, across the country? I guess anything. Uh yeah. Um, yeah. So 
Extinction Rebellion had a big May rebellion, and it was on May 1st to May 5th. It's a five-day event. And one of the key messages was all eyes on Fairy Creek. Mm. Um, tell the truth about what's going on. They had speakers who were talking about um, basically the horror of old growth logging, like like how disgusting on like a visceral level it even is. Um, and one of the actions that they had was, was one of the most visually interesting actions I've ever been to. They, okay, so I turn up at this intersection. I was told to go to the intersection at 12. They're like, don't go to the art gallery, go to the intersection. I'm like, okay. So I go to the intersection, there's no one there. So I go to the art gallery and I find a guy. I'm like, hey, do you know what's happening at the intersection? He's like, there's a boat drop, but keep it real down low. Just go there. And I was like, okay. So <laughs> I head back over there with my camera. I'm a photographer, so I'm taking pictures and I'm trying to be in the line of whatever's happening, right? And I'm, I'm kind of standing around and I see people kind of looking a bit sketchy on the street corners, like, you know, just looking around a lot. And I'm like, I go up to one and I'm like, hey, like, do you know about this boat drop? And she's like, I cannot confirm or deny anything. <laughs> I was like, okay, well, I'll just stand by you. I was like, well, do you know when it's happening? She was like, give it about 15 seconds. I was like, Whoa. okay. I'm like looking up, right? Like, where are they dropping this boat from? <laughs> um, and then just just as she says that, actually, I turn around, and there's this giant SUV pulling a, a covered trailer. And it pulls up into the, the intersection of Granville and Georgia, which is a huge main intersection in downtown Vancouver. And it just stops there. And uh, it stops there through the green light, through the red light. Everybody's honking. Everybody's freaking out. The police start to, like, bike over. And then all of a sudden, all at once, all of these people on all corners of the intersection, like, rip off their shirts. And they've got, like, these, uh, like, visibility vests underneath. Ah. And they've got buttons and pins and, like, you know, hauling visibility vests out, handing them to people around them. And this huge crowd just descends on this boat and starts, like, um, uncovering the trailer to reveal this giant pink sailboat on a metal trailer that says, tell the truth across the side. Wow. And, uh, yeah. And so then they put activists up in the boat and they were able to keep that intersection for seven hours because the police, while the police, I guess, figured out how they were going to get these activists out of the boat. Well, how did they get them out? <laughs> so... <laughs> This, so a dump truck shows up about five hours in a dump truck shows up and and I'm still not really getting it right like are they gonna pick the boat up and like dump it into the truck I don't know <laughs> and uh, and they back the dump truck up to the boat and then they've got the fire department so the fire department comes up on ladders into the dump truck and so then they pull the, the protesters out of the boat into the dump truck they strap them down onto stretchers with like you know belts and everything. And then they pass them down on the stretchers down the ladders. Wow. So it was quite an operation. And I see why it took so long because doing something like that safely would take a lot of pre-planning. Um, so that was an extremely effective way to occupy the intersection um, for a prolonged period of time. And, and that's really the point is yeah. of Extinction Rebellion is just to cause as much disruption as possible that the government has to take notice and, and has to at least hear what they are demanding. No, absolutely. Kudos to the organizers then. It sounds like, I mean, Extinction Rebellion is always very creative and they're yeah. very visual. And I really appreciate that because the rebellion can also be, I don't want to use the term fun here, but it can be creative because that's what we want. We want a creative world where everyday people have a choice in the decisions we make collectively or totally we have a collective choice about what is done with our environment. Totally. So great for them. You, you mentioned you have some GoFundMe links. You have some people to shout out. Go for it. Yeah, I do. Okay, so who is doing the work on the ground right now? We've got the Ancient Forest Alliance. We have Extinction Rebellion. Of course, we have Indigenous Land Defenders. And we've got the Rainforest Flying Squad. So I actually hadn't heard about them before, but they are doing a large part of the work. Um, so you can follow at Rainforest Flying Squad or at Fairy Creek Blockade on Instagram if you want to get progress updates, support links, just information about how to help. Um, their demands to Horgan specifically are to implement an immediate moratorium on old growth logging and to provide uh, conservation financing and economic alternatives for the First Nations and rural communities to ensure that all growth is protected forever and that no community is left behind. So they're really cool organizations to support. And just if you're all the way over in Ontario and you don't really know how to help out, uh, follow these Instagram pages and then they'll tell you. And then the GoFundMes. So the best go for the, the most prominent GoFundMe, I guess, is called Support for Indigenous Land Defenders Fairy Creek. And that one's raised over $44,000 from 727 donors so far. This is as of yesterday. So that's incredible. And I just, I love that people are coming together to support that blockade. It, 
$44,000 is an incredible amount of money to raise. Um, you can also, and I would highly recommend doing this, I've done this myself, you can call into the Prime Minister's office at 250, or the, the Premier's office, sorry, Horton, uh, at 250-387-1715. So I'll say it again, it's 250-387-1715. And uh, leave a voicemail, let them know exactly what you think. Um, if you've got a couple phone numbers, leave a couple voicemails. You can also email uh, premier at gov.bc.ca and do the same. And again, I have multiple emails, so they got multiple emails. Um, and then lastly, there is the Teal Jones group, which <laughs> I, I don't usually recommend calling customer service and complaining, but in this case, um, you definitely should. So they have S Boats, so S B O A T E S at tealjones.com. Or you can call them at 604 581 4104. And let them know what you think about their greedy profiteering on extremely, extremely old growth forests that'll never grow back. Yeah. Wow. Out here in New Brunswick, there's just these swaths of land that are just monoculture that's been mm -hmm. planted, like where, uh, like after clear cut, and there's there's nothing alive. It's like devastating to, when you when you're driving past and you just see this like bare forest. Um, and and the word ecosystem doesn't really describe it anymore. Um, so it's, it's really encouraging to hear that kind of thing. Thank you, uh, so much. Yeah. Well, I'm so glad you guys are talking about this because it honestly, like ever, I feel like everybody in BC is, is being emotionally affected at least a little bit by what's going on. Cause it just, you know, people say that BC is such a beautiful place to live and such a beautiful place to visit. And then we're just actively destroying everything that makes it beautiful. And yeah. that's kind of horrible. Yeah. Uh, well, thank you so much uh, for coming on. Uh, hopefully, uh, we'll hear some really great updates in months to come. And uh, yeah, thanks so much for showing up. And our next guest is going to be Sandra Griffith Bonaparte, president of the Union of National Defense Employees, Local 7067. And Sandra is also the Labor Forward candidate for vice president at the upcoming Canadian Labor Congress. Sandra, welcome. And tell us a bit about this Labor Forward Slate. What are you fighting for at the Canadian Labor Congress? The Labor Forward um, Slate is comprised of uh, um, four, four, um, four of us. Um, Julius Escott, um, Jenny, um, and Harold, and myself. A platform under the Workers' Action um, Movement, uh, which is um, shortened for WAM, um, the Labor Forward um, um, Slate strives to foster militant mm -hmm. democratic leadership to inspire union members to make a better world for the working class and humanity. This is going to be great. You know, we believe, we firmly believe that there's a big appetite out there for change in the labor movement because, you know, people have taken out our labor, um, our activists, they've taken out the move from the movement, mm -hmm. you know, but we believe, we believe as a slate, what is lacking is leadership. Yes. And um, so under the WAM, um, which stands for, you know, union and engagement in the, the class struggle, um, we are purporting that we fight against concession bargaining. Okay, yeah, that's and perfect. And against two-tier uh, wages and benefits and against the attack on a pension, because our pensions have been attacked over and over again. You know, our union leaders forever, they're forever telling us that we must settle for less. Mm -hmm. But we believe that we shouldn't settle for less at all. We insist that we cannot, you know, they're insisting that we cannot win by standing up. But we are insisting that if we stand up, guess what? We're going to win. And that's a platform. Um, so we want to show them that they are absolutely wrong. There's a visible shift in, in consciousness in the workers' movement as a result of the public health crisis mm -hmm. and the economic depression. So therefore, we need a movement that takes a leading role in fighting for the rights of our membership. And that's what we're doing. We want to fight. We want to make our voices loud and clear so that people know that we're the team for them. We're the team that should be going to the CLC because we are going to bring change, you know. 
We are going to bring grassroots, authentic, uh, organic uh, change. Well, that's brilliant. And everything you're saying is really exciting and necessary. From what I understand, even before the Canadian Labour Congress, and for the listeners who don't know, this is the biggest labour body in Canada, is it not? Yes, it is. Yes. And in the past, they would even call for a vote for the Liberals. They, they advocated for strategic voting. So from my perspective, you have such a big organization of organized workers that has so much power. Workers have all the power in society, yet they're collaborating with the bosses. They're undermining their workers at every turn. So all the best with the campaign. And how's it been going so far then? Obviously, it's a pandemic. The Congress is going to be virtual this year. So right. how are you getting the word out? How are you trying to engage with people? Well, the fact of the matter is we have been engaging with a lot of people. We have been um, speaking at various um, uh, labor movements. Um, mm -hmm. um, yesterday, we had a very good time with ACLA. Um, ah. I don't know what the acronym means. ACLA and the Black, um, the Coalition of Black Trade Unionists. Oh, great. And they are some hard questions, you know, but I'm telling you, we persevere and we <laughs> I don't want to say a bad word, but we really did well, you know, and we That's have wonderful. our voices and I think people are hearing us. And to me, our op opponents, they kind of scared of us. Um, um, Judas is a good speaker. You have Jenny and you have Harold and, and you all are standing up and show people that labor is your best choice. And we for labor and we believe that we are the best choice that could go to CLC. We believe that we're going to really bring changes um, to that place. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm inspired. I'm inspired. Initially, um, initially, I didn't even want to be part of this because I said, oh, I was sick and, you know, I don't have the time. Yeah. But I'm so happy that I decided to run with this slate because it's the strongest um, slate that I've ever seen before. And um, the encouragement that we get to we give to each other and get from one another is it's, it's, it's very uh, important. Well, know? that's brilliant. From what I under and, um, understand, so WAM, Workers' Action Movement, the first time yeah. they ran a slate was back in 2019 at the Ontario Federation of Labor. And that's how you would have found yeah. out about them, was it not? Yeah, actually, yes. And what happened when I saw, um, I can't remember the guy's name, but uh, Kurt. Yes, Kurt. Kurt. Kurt was running for vice Kurt president. Had, um, Yes. And, and Barry running for president. Yeah, they did pretty well. And I myself ran for the um, OFL a couple of years before. Ah. And I won the same 33%. Oh, wow, time. yeah. And and that time I was out there, you know? Yeah. And they did so well that I came outside and there was Barry. Yes. And I said, you know, I was very impressed, you know, with the guys, really. And I voted for them, you know? Yeah. And um, he invited me to sit through a meeting and I sat through the meeting and I liked what I was hearing and I said, okay, I'm going to become uh, a member of um, the socialist action movement. And That's here wonderful. I am, you know? Yeah. And so from what I understand with these with these campaigns, obviously winning would be great because all of a sudden now you have militants again in in charge of labor or at least leading later labor for the first time. Instead of having misleadership, you have real leadership. But really? bigger than anything, you can even see uh, building the party by attracting militants like you to it. So what are you hoping to get out of the CLC Congress? What for you would be considered a success? Well, you know, Yesterday, they asked a question about some of the recommendations. A 1997 um, task force was um, um, struck in 1997, and CLC came up with some recommendations. Mm. Um, but, you know, I told them, yeah, they came up with a recommendation, as CLC always does. There's recommendation. But I said, those recommendations, they're gone with the wind. Ah, uh, yeah. <laughs> they're gone with the wind. And they shall, you know. And, um, yes, they come out with a big rara. Yeah. And then they're quiet. Yes. But you know what I believe we are going to do? We're going to uh, form an organization that, you know, stands up for the rights of members. We're going to do what we say we're going to do. And, and yesterday I said, you know, you know, they come up with this bucket list yeah. of recommendations and things that they're going to do. And then you know what happened? They put water in the bucket. <laughs> <and> the, list, <laughs> the list is destroyed. And I said, you know what? 
You don't need to have a list, a bucket list of things that you're going to do. You only need to have three issues that you would want to deal with. Yeah. And at least you're going to know that you're going to get through them. You know, together with my colleagues, with, with our slates, when we get to CLC, we intend to make changes. We intend to bring back the other unions into the brothers and, and sisterhood to, to talk with us, you know, to plan with us, to strategize with us. Because without them there, you can't get anywhere. And if you're going to, we need to form the alliances with them. We need to show them that, you know, we need to do whatever we have to do to benefit the membership. And it's not about us. Yeah. It's not about, it's not about grease in our pockets. Yeah. You know? It's about representing the members equitably, putting your all into it, you know, let them know that we're here for you, yes. you know, and I'm so proud of uh, Juan for running, um, you know, um, the candidates for the CLC uh, position. Um, and as we, you said before, with militant, democratic, courageous leadership. And that's what we stand for. No, and absolutely. Nothing can stop because we're working for, the, is a working class, right? Yes. Nothing can stop. The, when you have the working class together, Yes. Nothing can stop the power of the working class. And it's all about the working class, you know? Amen. It's that's a, a primary uh, focus. No, 100%. So let everybody know, when is the Canadian Labour Congress? And what would you tell as a last message to anybody who's listening, who is a union member or who even might be a, a delegate to the CLC? What is your last parting words for them? It's time to fight. It's time to fight for minimum wage, $20 Yes. an hour. For public ownership of pharmaceutical industry, the giant telecoms, the huge retail chains, the big oil and gas, the banks, and the private long-term care center. It's time to stand up and fight against these people. It's time to put the move back into movement. Well, that's wonderful. Thank you so much, Sandra. Thanks so much for coming on our first ever episode of The Red Review. It's been great talking to you, and we would love to have you back on after the CLC to debrief about how it went, all the dirty tricks they've thrown at you, and how Wham! is growing to be bigger and stronger than ever. Thanks so much. Thank you, Dan. It was nice that you had me here. And I'm willing to come back. Brilliant. That's what I want to hear. <laughs> Thank you. This has been the Red Review brought to you by Socialist Action. If you agreed with the politics here, we invite you to join Socialist Action in our ongoing fight to dismantle capitalism and all its systems of exploitation and oppression. You can find out more about us at www.socialistaction.ca. We also invite people to join us in any of the United Fronts where we play a leading role, including the NDP Socialist Caucus and the Workers' Action Movement. Links will be in the description. So until next month, stay safe and solidarity.